and welcome back to the next installment in Math for Game Dev, the series in which we cover math topics that are just too useful to ignore. And I hijack the last half of each video to share the things I've baked recently. As some of you may have noticed, the thumbnail looks a lot nicer. No Billy Harrington this time. A fellow YouTuber called Alecki offered to help out with a few thumbnails. He's a nice guy and he uploads videos more than twice a week. I've included a link to his YouTube and Twitter in the description. Check him out. This episode we're going over linear algebra, which is is the study of linear equations, vectors, and matrices. For anyone that wants to go in depth on the subject, I highly recommend 3 Blue 1 Brown's Essence of Linear Algebra series. 3 Blue 1 Brown is a great math YouTuber. If you don't know about his channel already, check him out. His Linear Algebra series is in both video and article form, so you can digest it whichever way you prefer. And he presents all the topics so you develop a geometric, meaning visual, intuition of them. He goes a lot farther than I will, but then again, I haven't used an eigenvector for game dev yet, so I don't see a point in teaching you about them. Now we are approaching a more advanced topic. After all, we are already in the latter half of all the topics I plan to cover when I first started this thing. And since the topics are getting more advanced, are familiar with the earlier topics, especially algebra, becomes more important. So I'm saying this at the start. If anything I bring up in this video isn't clear to you, or you have trouble reading my handwriting in paint, or you just want to absorb it at your own pace, please let me know. I'll either try re-explaining said topic or point you in the direction of a better learning material. And if you're having trouble reading, I'll happily provide the script and all the math I write out in a legible PDF for your reading pleasure. Okay, now with all that stuff out of the way, let's look at what we're trying to do in this episode. And as a series first, we're doing a double feature. We're going to use topics from linear algebra to first create a stylized portal effect by manipulating UV coordinates and create a dither effect similar to the one seen in Oberdin. Next, we're going to attempt to recreate the stylized cell shader look in Breath of the Wild here. Now, I'm going to temper your expectations a little bit. These models and textures may look simple, but they are extremely high quality. A whole lot of Nintendo level craftsmanship went into them to make them look as gorgeous as they are. I will be using Unity 3D to demo this, because to do something similar easily in Unreal, you have to use post-processing. I'm using URP with Shader Graph, and I have a custom node that allows me to get the lighting information for a scene, which for some reason is not supplied by default, and if you want the source code for that, I've actually included the entire project. So if you want anything you see in this episode, give that a download. So hold on to your butts, Linear Algebra. First off, what's with the name? If we were to naively guess, Linear Algebra is the algebra of lines, which is basically it. Linear Algebra is a way to analyze linear systems of equations, which which are a bunch of line equations. Think y equals mx plus b, all put together. If we look at two lines, we can of course use math to determine if they intersect and where. Now using algebra, we can group both x and y on one side and the constants on the other. And going deeper into the vein of algebra, the variables matter, but not specifically. And since they don't, let's just chuck them. Now what we're looking at is a matrix. Very fancy, but never forget that underneath its cool look is just a couple of lines. Each matrix has a number of rows, which is the left to right stuff, and a number of columns, which is the up and down stuff. A matrix's dimension, or shape, is its rows by its columns. And we can also get an individual element of a matrix by referring to its row column coordinates, just like a point on a plane. Of course this matrix is square, but it can be any shape. We can spin a matrix across its diagonal by transposing it. We can make a matrix even cooler by ditching the equal sign and just separating the two sides with a vertical line. Very sleek. Now let's introduce x and y again. We can write them out in vector form, like so. Vectors can be written out vertically or horizontally, and with all kinds of brackets. Vectors don't have to be of variables, they can also be actual numbers. Whatever you need them to be, just make it so. Vectors are all over the place, not only in game development, but computers in general. We can multiply a vector into a matrix, like so. As you can see, we have to rotate the vector before we multiply it. This is a very important step, don't forget it. We can only multiply a vector by a matrix if the vector has the same number of elements as the matrix has columns. And just like with vectors, we can also multiply a matrix into a matrix. 
And just like with vector multiplication, we also have to rotate our matrix so that way we're multiplying the rows of the left-hand matrix by the columns of the right-hand matrix. As you can see, for matrices to multiply, the rows of the left-hand matrix have to be equal to the number of columns of the right-hand matrix. Also, matrix multiplication is not commutative, meaning that if we swap these two matrices, we're not guaranteed to get the same result. Of course, for the simpler stuff, we can also add and subtract vectors and matrices into each other if they have matching dimensions, and also multiply and dividing them by regular numbers by performing set operation to each element individually. And matrix division. Technically, there's no such thing, but if you ever need to, quote, divide by matrix, just multiply by the inverse of said matrix, which most math libraries let you do pretty easily. For a matrix larger than 3x3, three three, finding its inverse is just a big time sink, and I never actually needed to calculate the inverse by hand for a game, and rarely need the inverse itself, so I'm just gonna skip this. For anyone that really wants to know, check out that 3 blue 1 brown series I recommended. Now let's get to our first technical aside. Say we want to make a stylized effect for a portal we've got in our game. Maybe enemies spawn out of it. I don't know, it's your game. We're gonna whip up a RGB noise texture and also a simple grayscale mask for our portal. Again, we don't have to get too fancy because just like in the last video, I believe that we can achieve what we want primarily with math. So let's get to it. For those of you unfamiliar with how computers do 3D graphics, textures are mapped onto 3D models using UV coordinates, which are just two-dimensional vectors. So at each position of a mapped model, the computer can look up a corresponding point on the texture to determine what to show. We're going to pan the red and green channels of our noise texture different directions. To achieve this pan or scroll effect, we're going to add time scaled by some number to each of the individual chords. We can also add the sign of time to get an oscillating effect. After we get the pans we want, we then multiply them into our mask. And it's pretty dark, but just bear with me for a bit. It's gonna look good at the end. And since it's a portal, I want some spinning as well. For that, we're going to use matrix multiplication and our beloved trig functions. This is the rotational matrix. I never memorize it. I just know it exists and I look it up each time I need it and I expect you to do the same. So if we multiply the UV chords into our rotational matrix, we get, well, it's rotating, but I wanted it to rotate about the center, you know? UV chords define 0, 0 as the bottom left corner, so naturally our rotation matrix is rotating everything about that point there. If we want to rotate things about the center of the texture, we must first subtract 0 0.5 from our UV vector, then rotate that, then add 0 0.5 back to the result. This makes it so the origin of the texture is its center before we rotate it. Then once the rotation is complete, we return the origin to the bottom left corner. Now if we multiply it all up, do some smooth stepping, and LARP some colors, we get a stylized portal looking thing. Of course for a final version you might want an actual model instead of a quad, and some particles, maybe a light as well, but this is a good jumping off point. There are a lot of really cool effects you can achieve by just moving textures. And for anyone interested in the topic, a VFX artist for Rhyme did a number of presentations talking about how he achieved certain effects in game. I've linked one of his talks in the description. Check it out, it's great. Now for the second part of our first technical side. No, this isn't the second one. This is a double feature, not a triple. Let's try a dithering. We're gonna do the simpler two color type because well, I wrote out actual code for this episode. I'm not a happy camper. There are lots of ways to dither, but we're gonna cover dithering with a four x four bears matrix, then with a noise texture. Now I had to do some stuff with scriptable renderer passes in Unity to get this working, so if you want to see how I did it, download the project and read my notes. Just like models with UV coordinates, the screen itself has coordinates. We can read what color is at the screen for each coordinate and use that to determine how we're going to dither it. First, I set up some custom HLSL with our 4x4 bears matrix, which I got by looking up on Wikipedia. I also have a small function that I can use to compare a value against an element of said matrix, which does the dithering. I would have done it in Node but trying to get a single element from a matrix in shader graph is a cursed experience. So we take the screen chords, which like UVs go from zero to one, multiply them by the actual dimension of our screen, then mod them. And since
since we're using a 4x4 matrix, we mod it by 4. After that, we get the screen color, which I'm sampling with main text here. Again, check out my scriptable renderer pass for specifics. I convert the screen image to grayscale via the luminosity function, thanks Wikipedia. Then, compare the grayscale value at that pixel against the bears matrix. If the grayscale pixel is greater than the matrix's element, we output white, otherwise black. I like to multiply the grayscale pixel by a bias term so I can swing it closer to darkness or lightness for different looks. Of course, now that we have a black and white dither, we can have some fun and lurk between two colors using the result of the dither to achieve some really stylish stuff. Now that we know the idea behind ordered dithering, we can repeat the same thing but with a noise texture. Instead of modulus 4, we do the modulus of the dimension of our noise texture, then the same old comparing values. As you can see, the bias term is really handy here, since our noise texture may trend a little lighter or darker than the ordered Bayer's matrix. And for any of you wondering, I got this model off of Sketchfab. It's a CC0 model, so I'm free to do whatever I want with it. It's a study, or écoché, of an anatomical figure sculpted by Pierre Frankville. I've included a link to it in the description. Hopefully we're pretty comfortable with vectors after that, but allow me to introduce you to a special breed of vectors, the normal vectors. A normal or unit vector is any old vector whose magnitude, that is length, is 1. There are three very important normal vectors, i, j, and k, the three standard unit vectors, which are equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And since they are so special, they get hats. You can always convert a vector to a normal vector by just dividing it by its magnitude. Since normal vectors have a length of one, that means they have some special properties for the dot product. What is the dot product? Well, the dot product is just the element-wise sum of two vectors. The dot product of two normal vectors will always be between negative one and one. We can also use trigonometry, our favorite, to define the dot product. A dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times cosine theta, where theta is the angle between vectors A and B. And of course, if A and B are normal vectors, that means their magnitudes will be equal to one. So we see that that a dot b for normal vectors is equal to just cosine theta. This makes the dot product an extremely useful tool to measure the angle between two vectors. Next up is the cross product, which is unfortunately trickier to define than the dot product, but here we go. You see, we write it out as a matrix with i, j, and k as the first row, then the first vector as the second row, and finally the last vector in the third row. Then we do this. Yeah, it's pretty arduous. However, if we're to look at it geometrically, the cross product of two vectors is always going to be perpendicular to both of them. I myself use the cross product in sick transit to determine which way to tilt the camera while the player is wall running, so it has its uses. And that's all we technically need to know, if not a little more, to get cooking on our Breath of the Wild shader. First, we're going to identify the things we're looking to recreate. Breath of the Wild has two-tone shading, meaning instead of a gradient between fully lit and completely dark or occluded, there is a sharp threshold between the two. Next, it also has specular highlights that we see on the more reflective parts of the model. And finally, it also has rim lighting. So, to first achieve our two-tone cell shading, we're going to think. We have the normal vector of the model and also the direction of the scene light, also a normal vector. Using these two, we can create a basic lighting model by just taking the dot products of the two. Now, of course, you want to make sure your models have smooth normals, so if you're getting a lot of flat faces, you're going to have to go back into Blender and fix it. The lighting model we get by just taking the dot product here is called blend fong lighting. Of course we want a sharp threshold between light and dark, so we can either use a basic greater than zero to cut it off, or we can use our handy dandy smooth step. Just set the lower value to zero and the higher value to just shy of zero and it'll be a sharp threshold. As an added bonus, if you remember from last video, smooth step automatically clamps its output 
to between 0 and 1. After that, we're just going to multiply the smooth step result by the actual color of the light. Looking at what we have right now, there's an obvious problem. The dark side is black. We need to add a bit of ambient light. There are a number of ways to do this. I've whipped up a little mono behavior that allows me to set the ambient light for this scene programmatically. Download the project to see how I did it. Now that I have access to a global ambient light, we're just going to add it into the result here. And hey, looks like a step in the right direction. Now let's add our specular highlights. These are the bright points we see on the model that are supposed to be reflections of the light. These are view dependent, so as the camera moves around, the specular highlights will as well. Let's set it up. Of course, for specular highlights, I just looked it up and recreated it here. Nothing fancy. As you can see, we use power along with smooth step to get a really sharp threshold on the specular highlights. And we talked about power in the last video. I hope you remember why we're using it. And finally, let's add the rim light or backlight or kicker. This is just a light that helps outline the silhouette of the model against the rest of the scene and adds depth. Once you know about it, you can see it in a lot of movies. This is sort of a two for one because first we're going to create a Fresnel effect. The Fresnel effect is how some surfaces get more reflective when looked at a very shallow angle. And this is quite simple. As you can see, we just do this. Of course, we don't want a Fresnel effect, we want a rim light. So to do that, we're just going to multiply the result of our Blin Fong lighting and then smooth step that. Finally, we add it all up, make sure all our nodes are hooked up properly, and I'm gonna call it. For just a simple shader we whipped up, this is pretty damn close. And again, this is not my model. It's another one from Sketchfab. It's titled Ghibli Neal by Jason Coates. I've included the link to the model and Jason's Twitter in the description. So wrapping this all up, we covered a lot of linear algebra, but we still used the basic guidelines we laid out in the algebra video. And that is to think about what we want and what we have, then use math to bridge the two. We had a bunch of vector information, first UV chords, then the normals of our 3D model and the direction of our lighting. Then we used math to transform it into what we wanted visually. And that's it for this episode. 3D artists, you are now free to go. But I hope you all find these videos both informative and entertaining enough to keep watching the additional ones. Again, if you're comfortable with sharing it, I'd love to see how you guys are using them, either for games or 3D art or for something else entirely. And I'd like to share it with the rest of the viewers here. Anyways, next math video is going to be about calculus and I'm still deciding just how I'm going to present it. I might split it up into multiple videos or I might not, or I might release a devlog again finally live in fear and that's it for this episode as always thank you for watching i appreciate your time and i hope you have a good day if you liked this video please give it a like and if you like the series or want to follow along with my game's development, please subscribe. I also read all your comments and try to respond to all of them. They're amazing. Keep them coming. Every little bit helps out. I'm also on Twitter. I post some shit posts there now and then, but really, I just post pictures of what I've been baking lately. And speaking of baking, let's get to it. So, as you can see, back to macarons. And they're pink this time. That's right, they're not lemon flavored. Um, instead, these are red velvet macarons, so they have cream cheese frosting and also a bit of chocolate ganache in the inside filling them up. So yeah, they uh, they came out amazingly. My only complaint is instead of being red velvet, it's more like pink velvet. But as you can see, um, the shells look phenomenal and uh, this is just a gorgeous photo. I'm, uh, I've really been practicing how I take all my photos here. And uh, yeah, I gave, uh, I did like a double batch. So I ended up with, I think like 20 macro, well, not quite double, but basically double. I ended up with like 20, 40 shells and 20 macaroons. And um, I gave them like, I gave all of them away, but you know, I kept like four for myself, but still it's great. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I love giving them away. But I mean, well, the, speaking of charcoal fudge, we'll take a look at the inside here. And as you can see, they came out amazingly this time. Um, and, excuse me, not chocolate fudge, chocolate ganache. And in fact, there's a, there's a bit of coffee in the ganache. I like adding 
a bit of uh, espresso powder or just coffee in general to chocolate. I think it helps the flavor a lot. And um, my only complaint is, well, I mean, the shell's perfect and the flavors were gay. I liked it. Everybody liked it. They were gorgeous. Uh, my only complaint is that the frosting, the cream cheese frosting was too soft, whereas the chocolate ganache was too hard. So I froze a lot of them uh, because, you know, well, I gave them out over a long period of time. So, you know, when they tried to eat them, was well, they were just only partially defrosted. Like, you know, the, the frosting was just too soft, or its ganache was still pretty solid. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a perfect eating experience, which, you know, I'm really trying to, as you can see, I'm really trying to make these great and, like, exceptional. But um, I, one of my friends has extremely high standards. Um, uh, she actually helped, helped me learn how to make macaroons. She gave me a few pointers after my first few mistakes. Um, <laughs> Uh, but she saw these and she's like, "Wow!" I uh, she says she has nothing else else to teach me, so I'm uh, I'm on my own now, basically. And uh, but yeah, I gave I gave them away to just a bunch of people, a bunch of friends. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a great experience. They all they all loved them, to say the least. And uh, people are asking me for recipes now. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> I'll see what I can do. But uh, yeah, that's it. That's uh, that's it for this week. And uh, yeah, uh, the last half of the episode, not so much. But I'm gonna, I'm exhausted. Um, I've done a lot of talking. This episode's running long. But uh, I'm going for my, and I'm out of water. I I drink water throughout these things to keep myself kind of fresh. But I'm out. So I'm gonna call it here. Um, you guys should bake. Uh, it's a great hobby and once you're done with it you have something delicious you can share with either your friends or your family whoever you may care, care about in in your life and um, you know it's just a great way to show that you appreciate them so I'm um, using the old sign off even though I didn't use yeast this week uh, the yeast in the air is free go and bake and I hope you all have a Good day, and I'll see you next time.